All right. So since we are all, since we're about to start, right? Um, I'm going to um, welcome everybody and thank you for our attendees that are coming. I'm Nick. Um, I have volunteered to serve as the moderator. Um, last name is Angelov from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth Department of Public Policy. Um, I would like to let all of our presenters introduce themselves and say a little bit about what they do and what they're researching in, in their introduction. So since I don't want to do a formal introduction to everybody, because I think everybody should be able to tell us who they are personally. And so, um, and I think we are going to proceed in order of the program. Um, so the, the program that I have in front of me lists me as the first presenter. Uh, then um, we have uh, Tai Wu. Is that how you say your name? That's right, Tai Wu. Tai Wu. Hi, nice to meet you. A second nice presenter, then Kaleem, and then Chad. Um, and we're um, we're going to jump right into it. Um, as I said, I'm I'm an associate professor at the Department of Public Policy, which at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Um, we um, uh, teach in the Master of Public Policy program. And um, I am going to share with you today um, a book chapter of my uh -oh, PowerPoint. Why is not my PowerPoint wanting me to share? All right, I'm going to share my... Um, so I'm going to share a book chapter. Um, I'm going to try to talk really fast through it of my forthcoming book, which um, finally went into production two weeks ago. And it's um, on sustainable fashion legislation, which is um, happening within the last two years under the United Nations Development Goals. Um, it, it is a very new development in international legal platforms because the supranational organizations as the United Nations is assuming um, a, a framework from which it is asking member nations to legislate their own laws in order to mitigate the car carbon footprint of the fashion industry. So it was officially launched called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change for the Fashion Industry Chapter in 2018. And it was very popular as a social action with 40 conglomerates signing on to the charter um, to look for, the, for, for that legal framework that will guide the industry into what it's vowing to do, which is move towards circularity. Um, the charter is based on regional legislation or national legislation that's passed in several countries as the REACH um, re uh, resolution in the European Union, the zero liquid discharge laws in India and effluent treatment plant laws in Bangladesh. So th there's a, a legal precedent of national legislation that has debt passed on three entities. The European Union, um, uh, platform reach, although it is overreaching with the whole union, its implementation still happens in member states under guidelines. The other two precedents um, are actually mandatory laws and they were just made mandatory. They started off as voluntary mandates. They were just made mandatory um, in Bangladesh in 2020 and in India, I think in, in 2019. Um, and those are for factories involved in wet processes and textile manufacturing to actually use purification technologies. Before that, they were encouraged to do it and would have voluntary certification companies that will help them with their toxicity mitigation issues. But until the last two years, they were not mandated by national law to actually use the technologies that, um, that, that are available to them. So um, the issue is that these are very good laws that are being implemented. The problem is that they apply only under the discretion of national governments in their own respective countries. So um, um, there's a resolution that was passed three years ago in the Youth Flagship Initiative uh, on the government of the sector that calls for the actual European Union to develop a legal framework under which there could be agreement across the many nations of the supply chain in, in the production of clothes of compliance. 
Um, but at this point, unfortunately, nothing can really be established as legally binding because of one un very unfortunate fact when it comes to textile finishing, which is that most of the toxic elements in involved in it, 72 of them to be exact, um, there's, uh, there's very little that you can do in removing them. Um, or treating them with purification technologies. What you can do is zone factories away from um, uh, areas that are close to human contact, or you can limit the amount of volume that they're allowed to, uh, to operate at. But in terms of actually removing things like mercury and other sustained uh, dissolvable solids like bleach, um, you can't really purify bleach. There's no way to filter bleach out. If you're using bleach, you got to dump it somewhere and it goes into a river. So um, in order to move forward past this unfortunate reality, it's like, how do you treat effluent and how do you make governments actually um, come up with better alternatives and better solutions? Um, you create a bunch of guidelines and you create a bunch of platforms like the EU eco label that was established in 2011. Um, you have another waste framework directive under European Parliament and you put a bunch of guidelines that you're asking local governments to put into place. So um, at this point, the industry has moved into since we don't have binding regulations, how do we go about incentivizing um, better operations? Um, it's moved into this um, separate tier of consultancies that are now working both with local governments and with the actual producers for those consultancies to um, guide the chemical use and chemical disp disposal of hazardous materials. So th there's a bunch of them that have been in play and one major one has come out um, out of California. Um, it's the Higg Index um, and they're doing fairly well in terms of offering options in chemical processes. Um, but what we are seeing now under the US Charter for Climate Change is a thing that I have never seen in global governance before, which is actually asking politicians to run on platforms locally as they're running for office on implementing new still no nobody has done it there's a new law in france that that is being proposed right now going through the french parliament um, to mandate inclusion of environmental scorecard information on labels um, so now we have a mandate under the un where we're going to ask in the future our politicians to be including the issue in their in their political platforms. So um, that's pretty much what I have in terms of, of the technicality of the paper. And I know it's a very complex and multi-layered issue. So I would answer any questions that you all might have in, um, after the presentations are over. Thank you. So table next. Okay, yeah, can everyone hear me? Okay, um, thank you. So uh, my name is Taiwo. Um, I'm a graduate student uh, from the School of Public Service at Old Dominion University here in Virginia. And um, I'm going to be um, taking us through uh, the roles and challenges of environmental nonprofits. Um, specifically, I'm concentrating on the environmental nonprofits in Virginia. And so I'm just um, going, I'm exploring the roles and the challenges uh, that they face in shoreline management for coastal resilience. And so uh, <laughs> my slides are pretty much, so I'm just going to kind of rush through them and give um, an overview of uh, what I'm trying to get at. And this is actually my um, dissertation. So I'm trying to build on it early. Uh, so, and to also get um, other people's perspectives on the research and um, any recommendations as I go along. Um, thank you. So um, 
pretty much we we are seeing that the impact of climate change is continually increasing you know everybody's talking about it and um, everyone is trying to make sure uh does there are sustainable solutions you know to cope them and environmental nonprofits actually also pray they play critical roles in um doing this and especially uh focusing giving a concentration on shoreline management. And so they play a crucial role. Uh, and this is especially specific to land conservation environmental nonprofits. So I just, in the literature, there has been very little knowledge about um, the roles they actually play and the challenges, especially the face in um, shoreline management. And so this is what the research, the research um, is really about exploring in detail. It's a qualitative research. So it's kind of exploring in details the role and challenges of um, these environmental nonprofits. Uh, so um, the theoretical framework I'm trying to pin down with this um, research is the structural um, functionalist theory by Emily Donkine. And um, it's just uh, posing that um, structures should actually, um, if the whole will work properly, if um, perhaps environmental policies would be effective, if environmental policies would be better, if we would see the impact on our environment. Uh, the structures concerned uh, should actually perform their functions and, and do well in making sure that uh, these functions are actually effective. So um, I'm trying to look at uh, the functions that environmental nonprofits in this sense as a, a subsector in the nonprofit sector, what, what they do about it and the challenges that actually hinder them for, from um, doing this. And so, yeah, I mentioned the scope of study and just to give a, a brief background of really what shoreline management is you know it's just building strategies building setbacks um that uh, will help us defend our environment well you know uh, especially um coastal zones coastal um, um communities and so uh, my research questions are just really three core ones like we want well, i want to know to what extent these environmental nonprofits are actually involved in shoreline management and what, what are the roles they play and um, the challenges they face in doing the same. Uh, so um, the research is limited to Virginia. Um, as I said, Virginia environmental nonprofits and 85 Virginia environmental nonprofits are being considered. Um, there's, it's a mixture of interviews and document analysis, um, doing a document analysis of 85 Virginia environmental nonprofits. And I also uh, did um, 10 interviews of environmental nonprofit representatives and leaders. And just to um, stress the significance of the study, you know, we, we know that coastal sustainability is important, especially um, in the world that we have today. And um, it's important to actually explore pers different perspectives um, of uh, uh, um, professionals and the roles they play. And that's why for this um, study, I'll be focusing on nonprofits. And so I use the constructive met um, contrast constructivist methodology, you know, get multiple stories about roles they play and the challenges they face as well. And also interviews, I, I mentioned that already, you know, I did interviews and document analysis uh, for data collection. Um, I used Charity Navigator and um, Geister um, plus the professional interviews that I have. Um, and Vivo um, for the qualitative analysis package. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, of course, the results are being transcribed. And uh, okay, so um, for the involvement, they're actually highly involved. Um, they are involved in training, they're involved in development, they're involved in mentoring professionals that are involved um, in social um, in coastal sustainability and generally environmental sustainability. They also collaborate with NGOs, you know, they collaborate in, um, with environmental nonprofits NGOs, they collaborate with human service NGOs uh, to do the same. They are also involved in state legislation and zone ordinances. Um, for their roles, they are involved in shoreline restoration, they're involved in, you know, hostel restoration, uh, they're involved in advocacy, they're involved in education. They also work with um, volunteers 
uh, you know, to support home owners in maintaining their properties, you know, especially home owners who have their properties close to the zones, um, close to coastal zones, you know, in coastal communities and close to uh, the water. So um, for the challenges they face, um, many of them, one that is <clears throat> particularly particularly striking uh, with me, um, for me, is the problems they actually face with permitting process. You know, almost especially in the interviews, or, or almost all, if not all the participants uh, actually mentioned this as a problem. And they had mentioned, you know, high bureaucratic energy. They used to do permits on the three weeks before, and then it takes, now it takes them like three months as contractors, as environmental nonprofit representatives to get permits to work on a property, you know, and they say they have different unrealistic expectations by the board. You know, they also, mentioned one particularly important thing about um, the lack of gui guideline books. And so they mentioned that they, they, there are, there are um, guideline books over the years, but now they are no longer functioning and it had been helpful before now. And so those are really some of the issues. And one other um, issues from the finding is also about in the in inexperienced wetland board members. And so these are the issues coming up, coming up from um, the, the findings. And really uh, the solutions that uh, we can draw out, you know, given from the study, you know, the solutions have been that there should be less bureaucracy in the permitting process. You know, maybe um, the local staff or the local board members should be reduced. And maybe the agencies that the permits will go through should kind of be reduced as well. And also talking about uh, training for the wetland board members, they're saying, hey, <laughs> don't just let anyone be part of the boardland member for uh, be a part of the boardland members from the community without kind of giving them some sort of training. And so they also talked about funding, the need for funding for environmental nonprofits. They also spoke about flexibility regarding their work uh, that, you know, homeowners sometimes have an expected way for them to do things, especially as contractors. So they spoke about that, that, you know, they needed more flexibility about um, their own hand products. You know, sometimes homeowners think riprap is the best solution to for uh, you know <laughs> what what they have to do the project they have to do and the contractor is saying it's a living shoreline I think a living shoreline will work here so it's just like an understanding situation trying to understand each other and allowing um, environmental nonprofits to take the professional role or um, contractor in that context and so for implication. Um, you know, if these are, what are the implications on policy? I think this will actually drive policy understanding and help, you know, maybe um, the state of Virginia policy decision makers at the state and local level to really see what is happening and um, where to address solution, where to address, um, uh, where to really concentrate on and bring sustainable solutions. And um, also the limitation of this study is that it's actually, kind of limited to Virginia. So we may not, although there might be some similarities in um, states when we compare them in terms of research, but we cannot categorically, you know, generalize, generalize this result beyond Virginia because it's particularly unique for the state of Virginia, because the environmental nonprofits explored are uh, environmental nonprofits that are actually based in Virginia. And for future research, um, it's really, you know, explore the perspectives of policy experts on the role that environmental nonprofits, you know, play in shoreline management uh, as we enhance coastal resilience. Um, thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Like, I mean, on the second <laughs> 10 minutes. Wonderful. <laughs> Galeen, floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Nick. Let me share my screen. And introduce yourself as you're doing that. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, so, hello, everyone. Thanks for um, having me. 
first time at this uh, Northeast Conference. Um, so happy to be here in this, uh, in this session. Um, I am an assistant professor at the uh, Biden School of Public Policy and Administration, University of Delaware. Uh, at our school, we have some, you know, as, as you would guess, we have several programs. Um, one of our strongest but longest uh, standing programs is the Energy and Environmental Policy Program, which is, uh, which is where I, this is my shop. So um, most of my work actually is based outside of the US. I would say probably 25% of my work is actually based uh, on US um, um, policy. Um, and today I'll actually present on, on that. Most of my other work is in, actually in, in developing countries and, and more international. Um, but this, this uh, what I'll present today is based on some of our ongoing work in our um, in our program our energy and environmental policy program with the uh, u.s department of energy um, so today i'll talk about one particular uh just one second let me have a have a challenge with my screen uh, view okay there we go sorry about that all right so one particular program is what i'll talk about today the uh, the U.S. Clean Cities Coalition Program, which is out of the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and it's an, an very interesting program because um, it is one that promotes public-private partnerships between the DOE and uh, business, nonprofits, uh, educational institutions, and so on, um, and meant to drive um, uh, clean energy policy, particularly in the transportation sector, um, um, through uh, very local actions. So to begin with, this, uh, this program actually stems from the Energy Policy Act of 1992, that was the first to start encouraging vehicle fleets, especially and starting from uh, the public sector vehicle fleets to acquire AFVs, alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, so by 2003, the DOE introduced what they call the Clean City, what, what would become the Clean Cities Coalition Program. And the objectives are to build partnerships to advance uh, affordable domestic transportation fuels and technologies. It is administered out of the Vehicles Technologies Office um, and there's a num there are a number of activities now. So, you know, between 2003 and, and now, um, the program has evolved and so on. But basically, the core, the core tenets of the program are to build partnerships with local coalitions, public, private sector, transportation stakeholders, as I mentioned, to also develop information resources on alternative fuels, uh, advanced vehicles, meaning hybrids, electric vehicles, and so on, uh, mobility choice, um, um, to develop online tools to assist local stakeholders in uh, expanding their, uh, their fleets uh, in terms of alternative fuel vehicles, uh, to share best practices amongst all of the coalitions that are, I'll show you where they're located uh, on the next slide. Um, to lend technical assistance. So this, the, the city, the, the coalitions um, sort of become the network for the US DOE Vehicles Technologies Office to, uh, you know, conduits to get technical assistance to specific local uh, uh, jurisdictions um, and to seed local alternative fuel markets. So um, the DOE providing funds for lots of pilot programs, um, uh, pilot uh, electric vehicle adoptions, pilot hybrid vehicle adoptions, um, ethanol-based fuels, uh, and so on. So, so this is basically what the uh, Clean Cities program does. There are, about, there are over 100, just over 100 uh, coalitions across the US. So you'll see on this map that um, Many states may have um, several, several of these coalitions, all right? So what you do is there would be a focal organization that applies with the US DOE to form a coalition. 
and you would need to have a certain amount of partners, a certain amount of uh, resources, structure, and so on to start the coalition. From the DOE point of view, they're also looking for, they're targeting almost like markets, right? They're targeting uh, local jurisdictions that they can establish these coalitions in. All right. Now, once the coalitions are started, they're fairly independent. Okay. Um, um, it's just they're almost like a pre qualified um, 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 contractor that the DOE will go to uh, exclusively for this kind of work in that particular uh, jurisdiction or market. All right. So there are over 100. Um, now some of them are very active. Uh, most of them are actually very active, but we found that some of them are not really active. All right. So you'll see, you know, um, uh, sort of like on the uh, some of the on, on the coasts, you'll see um, there are coalitions that um, are in jurisdictions that are city based. Some of them are state based. Some of them are maybe regional over a couple of counties and so on. Um, but largely, they are they are not they're they're non competitive coalitions. All right. Um, now the research really so far in how these coalitions work to advance this objective have been around the the, the type of clean technologies implemented um, by the coalitions, and the objective here of the coalitions is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions uh, within that particular um, uh, region uh, or locality, right? Based on how much of the technology they can, um, they can implement, how much, how much of the market they can encourage to transition to alternative fuel, fuel vehicles, electric vehicles, and so on. So, you know, in this table here, you see some, just name some of the technologies. This is from the 2017 uh, reporting. Um, but just in this first column, so there's, you know, the types of things they implement alternative fuel vehicles, um, uh, technologies for fuel economy improvements, uh, HEVs, hybrid electric vehicles, technologies for idle reduction and things like public buses, school buses, and so on. So a host of different things, right? But that's where the attention has been. What technology leads to more greenhouse gas emissions averted, right? Or, or, or not not produced. So here we look at actually the organizational characteristics of the coalitions themselves. These are structures that are now in, independent, and they had a draw from public member, public sector members, local and state government agencies, utilities, um, power generation uh, agencies, uh, school districts, and so on. And, and business and industry and in nonprofits, right? So no one has really looked at how these coalitions um, look in terms of you know the organization and linking that to if you know if they if that results in higher or lower GHG emissions averted. So this is what we try to do here. Um, and I'll just go through quickly so my time doesn't run out. Um, I just was going to tell you a minute and a half. Okay, so we look at coalition structure, coalition resources, and coalition strategies um, to determine what characteristics link to emissions uh, reductions. All right, so we do, I'll just mention this, uh, we take a statistical approach, a pooled OLS regression, which allows us to reduce some of the uh, data gaps there in the time series analysis. There were uh, 96 coalitions that are reported on. Why, after we cleaned data and did the data quality checks, we based this analysis on 78 coalitions across, across the country. Um, and what we find here is, let me just get down to it. We find through the, uh, the analysis, a couple of different things. Um, that come up statistically significant. In terms of the coalition structure, the structures that exhibit higher performance are larger coalitions, and this is supported in the literature. This is not something that is strange, right? Larger coalitions. Um, but what we do find is when we look at the diversity of the membership of the coalitions, um, the diversity of the private sector members 
is much more important, is significant. Whereas the diversity of public sector members of the coalition are not, all right? Also very significant um, for higher performance uh, is having members with larger fleets, right? Um, uh, that turns up to be uh, pretty important as well. Um, coalitions that are hosted by government organizations as a focal point or by nonprofits um, as opposed to businesses or even universities being focal organizations for the coalition to build around. Um, the government organizations and the nonprofits are far more successful um, than if you build the coalition around um, a private sector entity or even a university type entity, which are the other two main types. Um, the second piece that we look at are resources. And I will just get to the results. Um, and what we find here is that um, total funds allocated or earned by the coalition um, doesn't seem to matter as much as the ability to win the DOE specific grants. Remember these coalitions um, um, now are qualified to access certain grants that other organizations cannot. So your ability to win those grants uh, leads to higher performance. Um, also, membership dues. Membership dues are between 18 and 22% of total um, uh, funds that come into these coalitions. So not so a, a, minor, a minor amount, um, but it seems that the, 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 the more efficiency in collecting membership dues also leads to higher performance. And this is interesting because this may show that there is, uh, the more loyal your members are, the more engaged your members are, the higher the performance that the overall coalition can, can have. Um, and then finally, the different types of strategies to, uh, to meet the GHG uh, emissions targets. Um, we find that coalitions that host regular membership meetings, that engagement of your actual members, um, uh, exhibit higher performance. Now, so as the coalition also needs to expand and also needs to bring in public engagement, right? And social and traditional media provide, uh, exhibit, uh, uh, the more that they invest in uh, traditional media and social media, uh, it leads to higher performance. And interestingly, um, the more that the coalition invests actually in traditional print media, um, it's not that it doesn't have any impact, it actually lowers performance. So, Focusing on the brochures and the information, educational material and so on, seems to, interestingly enough, um, uh, bring on lower performance than if you were paying more attention to um, 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 media interviews, television, and social media. And we break that down a little bit later on as well, but I'll stop there um, because my time is up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next is Chad. Thank you very much. Um, share this really quickly. My name is Chad McGuire, and I am a professor of public policy and also chair currently of the Department of Public Policy at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, uh, along with Professor Angeloff. Back in February, when I submitted this, uh, this proposal for this talk, I had a paper, a working paper that I had developed and it recently got published about a month ago. Uh, and not that you're able to copy down that uh, link, uh, but if there was another way of getting this out there in a PDF format, you'd be able to see a more detailed version because the paper, um, some of what I'm talking about today uh, is, is given a, a lot more uh, detailed treatment in that paper. But what I'm talking about effectively is, you know, we have, uh, we have risks uh, at our coastline, we always have. Coastlines have uh, presented themselves with risks depending on which, where you live, the coastline, whether it's here in the United States or uh, na uh, internationally, always hurricanes or typhoons or other uh, things that uh, depending on where you live, nor'easters up here in the nor'east, uh, northeast are specific. 
uh, risks, uh, but now with climate change, we have uh, expanding risks, uh, including sea level rise, coastal erosion, things that uh, Tai Wu brought up a bit in terms of at least looking at uh, some of the uh, nonprofit organizations. So, so when we look at these risks, um, one of the things that I look at is, well, what are our existing policy structures? What do they look like and how are they helping uh, to deal with this risk? In other words, um, you know, uh, climate change itself um, is providing us with new information and changing our basic assumptions on how the world works. Uh, you know, uh, so if we always assume that everything was static, climate change presents variability to that, that, that assumption. It changes that static nature. Um, things get warmer in certain places, uh, things get wetter in certain places, things get drier. Uh, so it's changing our, our, our background assumptions. And the question is, what are we doing to uh, respond to those assumptions? And um, it's not easy because we have specific policies, uh, government policies that are geared towards trying to address um, mostly in a sort of a resilience uh, capacity building, uh, especially when we, when we talk about coastal management. So government's doing some things, the private sector is doing some things, but what I look at is the difference between what government is doing specifically towards these items. In other words, what policy is being developed to treat climate change in coastal areas and what effect do other policies that aren't necessarily intended for that purpose, do they have an effect on the ability of government to perform its task? So I'm looking at uh, policies that might have counterintuitive outcomes where other policies might be uh, in inhibiting the ability of properly addressing uh, this risk. So, you know, climate change provides new information and changes our existing assumptions. And um, one of the key um, other things we need to understand about climate change is that the effects are cumulative and dispersed. Um, so, you know, climate change doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen at once and it's not caused by one thing. And that's important to understand because you think about it, if you're thinking about developing policy to address it, it's like, wow, it comes from various sources and it's not something that is specific. We can't just look at a specific cause. And so that makes it difficult. Um, and that impacts the way in which we perceive the risk, right? So imagine if a risk aggregates slowly over time building up and it doesn't exhibit itself all at once, we might see, for example, an event like Superstorm Sandy or some of the recent hurricanes that we've had, Rita, you know, down in Houston, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, we see these things on an individual basis and we think about them from an individual standpoint and they come and they have an effect and then they go away. And uh, we don't think about it in a cumulative sense. We look at them discreetly, individually. And so what that does is that causes public institutions some hesitance in the way that they want to respond. In other words, you know, you think about it, if it's a piecemeal activity, if it's something that happens on an individual basis, a, a, a discrete unit of time, then you want to deal with it and remedy it in a sort of a, an ad hoc basis, right? You want to deal with that one instance of that, that natural disaster, for example, right? Uh, and uh, not necessarily look at the bigger picture of how are these disasters, are they occurring? Are we caught, you know, are they occurring more frequently, more often? Um, and are they causing uh, greater risk to accumulate in certain areas? And are we internalizing that risk in our proactive decision making? So one of the difficulties there is that um, climate change is forcing us to maybe uh, look at something in a way that doesn't make sense to our existing ways of doing things. So our, our existing path dependence. And what that means is that the dynamics of decision making and framing, if you think about some of the history of some of the work that's been done on this, how humans think about problems, how they define them and how they sort of rationalize and sort of compartmentalize the way in which they make decisions based off of problems. Uh, it causes some, some difficulty in trying to think about how we're going to deal with um, large scale, proactive, proactively deal with things like climate change, something like it that aggregates over time. Um, and, you know, the problem with the climate change attributes being non-ideal for rapid policy evolution is because, because of those characteristics I described above, um, there, it can see doubt. In other words, you know, Superstorm Sandy was horrible in 2012, in November of 2012, when it occurred for New Jersey and coastal uh, New York. Um, but then 2013, it was a pretty good year, you know? So, so that creates a, a degree of doubt in terms of, you know, well, this is something that we can deal with. It's a one-off and uh, we'll deal with it, but we really don't need to build in strong proactive resiliency into this. So what that means is that, you know, if we were thinking about policies that were going to interrupt previous existing policy structures and dynamics, 
because of the nature of climate change, it's more likely that those existing structures stay in place because there's a bit of doubt as to, gee, should we go through this? Should we spend all this money, all this time and energy when we don't know if this thing will happen again or if it'll be that bad? The genesis large scale of the problem in the United States and in most of the uh, other parts of the world, particularly the United States, is that we are a coastal nation. Most of our land mass is not coastal, but we live in coastal areas and most of our economic activity occurs in coastal areas. So because of that, you know, our coastlines and our coastal regions and our coastal watersheds become incredibly important simply because we've chosen to be there. And so what we've done is we have a historical antecedent, you know, at least European settlement, but also pre-European Mesoamerican to some degree, but certainly European settlement and after. We've, you know, we, we came here from boats, we wound up on coastlines and we've done a lot of, you know, we, we built up a lot of our capacity along coastal areas, our major cities. And this isn't again, unique to the United States and many other coastal nations, it's the same thing. Humans tend to live along coastal areas and they do most of their economic activity. So they're really important. So if we spend a lot of time, money, and energy in coastal areas, the idea is that mostly uh, we're going to look to re, you know, replicate that. We're going to protect that. We're going to reinvest in those areas as opposed to simply like, for example, move away from uh, these areas. If we think about that more sort of like at a, a, a sort of a concrete level or a finer uh, level, if we think about, you know, our current policy setups is that we have a lot of public subsidies that are built into living and building and developing in coastal areas. And those public subsidies um, happen from the national level to the local level. Um, and just at the national level in the United States, we have pretty significant subsidies in terms of flood, dis flood insurance and disaster relief. And what they do fundamentally is they help to discount, they help to, 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 to sort of shed that risk, not, the, not only the existing risk of coastal areas, but the sort of accumulating risk that's happening with climate change. It's a, it allows you to sort of discount that risk um, in terms of those uh, subsidies. You pay a lot less for flood insurance than you should. Uh, most people that live in uh, sensitive uh, coastal areas and um, disaster relief provides you with uh, a lot of money to help repair damage that's occurred in coastal areas because of uh, coastal storms and intensity of coastal storms that are directly related uh, to climate change. We also have uh, uh, strong disincentives in terms of uh, dealing with coastal issues from the amenity value. Coastal property is generally highly sought out, it's valuable. It provides an important uh, you know, financial structure for the local tax base because you know, your residential and commercial properties in coastal areas are much of the resources that local governments have for providing the health, safety, and welfare, you know, all of the things that they're required education uh, to fund those activities. And of course, the real estate market is really important as well. Uh, generally speaking, uh, people aren't interested in having devaluation of their coastal properties. Nobody wants to either buy or sell something for less than they bought or sold it for. Um, and then there's this new interesting area that's recently been explored uh, mostly in uh, economics, but capital investment pre and post hazard. Uh, what we do in terms of how we fund in the private markets and uh, financial markets, how we fund both disaster uh, itself, disaster relief, and also um, how we fund um, post disaster, uh, the development of, of infrastructure, the development of buildings, the development of uh, homes, that sort of thing. So, what I what I can highlight in this uh, in this talk in about three minutes is uh, three major federal uh, counterproductive policies that I found that really sort of run into or disrupt the existing um, policy development for proactively dealing with uh, coastal climate change adaptation. Federal disaster assistance is definitely one of these major um, federal policies, and again, these policies are not intended to disrupt climate change adaptation along coastlines, they just have the effect of doing it. You know, federal aid to, uh, for state governments under duress due to natural disasters, that's the point of federal uh, disaster assistance. The unintended consequence, one of them, is that it provides a de facto zero premium flood and hurricane insurance to inhabitants of risky coastal areas. If you don't have flood insurance, and if you're not required because you don't have a mortgage or you just simply have let it lapse, and you're living in a risky flood area, you have no uh, insurance against that flood, but the federal government providing you with disaster relief should you have a major flood and a federal disaster be declared in your coastal region, then you're provided with lots and lots of what effectively is a de facto zero premium. You don't have to buy flood insurance if you get federal disaster relief in many cases. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, subsidy going on there. 
Public flood insurance is the other one. If you are required to have flood insurance and um, it is only publicly available in the United States because no private insurance company will provide flood insurance because it is not actuarially sound. They can't make money off of it and the losses are too high and they'd have to charge premiums that nobody would want to pay. And that would affect the home value of coastal areas. So we have a national or a public flood insurance program and it is heavily subsidized. Not only is it, uh, you know, the premiums the people pay are much lower than is required to have it actuarially sound. How do we know this? Because no private insurance company will get into the flood insurance market in the United States because they charge too high of a premium. The unintended consequence of this, the, you know, the purpose was to shift risk, you know, allow people to develop and live in those, those high economic value areas of the coastline, is the unintended consequences, it allows for the shifting of coastal development risks. And then we have coastal property financing. These are the GSEs, uh, the government sponsored enterprises, Fannie and Freddie Mae, most of us know them uh, by them. Conforming loans, loans that private um, mortgage originators, private banks can make to individuals for residential properties along coastal areas that they can then take the loan and immediately transfer all of the risk of the loss of that loan to these government entities, Fannie or Freddie. You'll often see that if you've bought a house and you've seen you know, conforming loans, only 3% down sort of thing, that is where the bank is, is shifting the risk. And what ends up happening is that um, the unintended consequences here is that we have a mechanism to originate loans in risky coastal areas without private internalization of risk. Fascinating research has been done to show that after a disaster, the level of conforming loans pr from prior to disaster to after disaster in coastal areas, New Orleans, I mean, any of the Houston, you name it, the level of mortgage origination goes through the roof, the rate of mortgage origination of, of conforming loans, Fannie and Freddie, increases dramatically after a disaster. The non-conforming loan rate decreases, almost goes to zero after a natural disaster. What that tells you is that those banks and mortgage originators, they're internalizing the risk. But what they're doing is they see an opportunity to provide a lot of new financing for home, as long as they can shift the risk to the government sponsored enterprise. The evidence for this is overwhelming and clear. The fact is both Fannie and Freddie and government regulations do not require Fannie and Freddie to consider flood risk when they determine what is a conforming and non-conforming loan. That's amazing, think about that. So the government entities don't even know that this is a flood risk home because they don't ask for it and it's not required to be disclosed. So that's, uh, so what this ends up being is, you know, you end up having actual risks, you know, you have a, a sort of a disproportionality or a disconnect between the actual risks that are there and increasing and the perception of those risks. And these three government entities, these three government programs, which are the GSEs, the financing, a federal disaster relief and flood insurance, public flood insurance, what they help to do is they help to create a disconnect between what are the actual and increasing risks in many coastal areas and what are the perceived risks. It was a very recent article, if you see here up in the left uh, on NPR, discussing um, how most flood risk isn't disclosed when, for homeowners when they purchase homes. Uh, and it's, if you get a chance, and again, I know it's difficult, but you can look it up. Uh, it was very recent. The other uh, uh, item I have here is you can see a picture. This is uh, in 2016, Cape uh, May, New Jersey. Now, Cape May was one of the significant areas that was struck by uh, Hurricane uh, Superstorm Sandy in 2012. And if you can look in the back, in the very back, the large structure you see back there, you can see this is a flooding event that occurred. This is four years after Superstorm Sandy. And you can see it says, of course, custom builders, a luxury waterfront townhomes. They never intended it to be that level of waterfront, right? You know, you're literally outside your door. But the, the building in the back and the building just to your left uh, in the forefront with the green, those were both built after Superstorm Sandy and they were financed through government sponsored enterprises. So. It's fascinating. Uh, my point in, um, in, in suggesting this is that um, we have a scenario where, you know, you can see it sort of playing itself out in action where we're putting, you know, throwing our, our good taxpayer uh, funded dollars because taxpayers uh, insure Fannie and Freddie. Anyway, overcoming these policy barriers, if we're thinking about the, the notion of these existing policies that have an unintended consequence or legacy uh, policies, uh, we have to see the connections between climate change, coastal resiliency, and current policies. 
And fundamentally, we need to rethink what is coastal risk assessment. And uh, you know, what I mean by that is we need to re-educate not only the people um, that are living in coastal areas and the people that are managing these coastal areas, but we need to start internalizing those risks and take a more proactive policy agenda. So think about it as a sort of a risk-based so you look at these areas as sort of risk areas as opposed to sort of revenue areas, which is how they were looked at now. Um, so uh, specific things that can be done, you know, Fannie and Freddie basically remove, um, well, in adverse selection, I'm sorry, and in ensuring compensating losses, uh, internalize those risks. And for the Fannie and Freddie scenario, you know, you, you have to really make sure that those mortgage originators and the banks um, maintain skin in the game, that they have to, you know, if they're going to originate a loan for a very dangerous area that they have to have financial uh, skin in the game because what the data tells us and the research shows is that they're not willing to uh, for non-conforming loans where they have to hold the risk they're not willing to do it so that's it thank you all right so um thank you fascinating and uh now it's time for questions from the audience it seems we have a good amount of attendees so um, hit us up. Can they, um, Nick, do you know if they can, uh, can they speak verbally or do they do it by messages? Um, I can see the chat right now. So, um, but. So I can, I can, I can monitor the chat and we can answer that way. Can, can all of the panelists see the chat feature? Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Um, So where the toxic elements that I was describing in, in my um, uh, my presentation, they're actually in, uh, they're not in the close. Well, they're in the close, but we have a lot of regulatory ways of, of treating non-leaching elements in the close. Um, they're in the water being expelled in when you're actually making yarns and fabrics. So they're, um, they're called dissolvable, so dissolvable solids and suspended solids and include heavy metals and uh, carcinogens um, and just chem basic chemicals that are uh, part of any dyeing and finishing processes. So um, is Chad, that you Chad or is that another Chad question for Chad? It must be another chat. Oh, I think that's they're saying chat agree. They're just uh, identifying me that they. Oh, they're just identifying with you, Hannah. <laughs> oh, um, so I I'm going to start first answer really quickly. One of the uh, things that's being proposed legally and in, in uh, the sustainable fashion field is to actually include uh, mandate, but include more information to the consumer in terms of understanding what is involved in uh, the, the production of, the, of clothes. So now they're coming up with a metric called environmental scorecards, and you can actually have um, digital ID that can be put on a label. So if there's, let's say, um, a scale being developed that hasn't been agreed on, but it can be like 100% sustainable or 50% sustainable. They want that information now actually on a label of a piece of garment. So the other panelists, what can the public do to help in on your issues? You know, what I was thinking, it, it, this is Chad, uh, I, you know, I was listening to Taiwo, I, I was thinking uh, part of your discussion is about, you know, educating, we, we have the same thing in many states, Massachusetts, Virginia sounds very similar in terms of wetlands protection. We think about coastal areas and we think about wetlands protection. The idea of, um, you know, of having people on the wetlands board, you know, those appointed local citizens, oftentimes they have no expertise, you know, it's the grocery store, it's the, you know, it's the retired teacher, it's the whoever it might be. In Massachusetts, we have something called a conservation agent. They're the technical specialist that helps to inform the local board, the local wetland board, um, and bring them up to speed on a level of expertise. And the reason I bring up the expertise, because as you were saying, I agree, it's really important that the local decision-making internalize that expertise. What I'm talking about in my presentation is at that larger scale is that as a public, you know, if we believe that policies are established to help create carrots and sticks, to help you know, direct the public. And if the public is uninformed in general 
and to direct them into right into the right kinds of activities. Part of policy is for that, right? It's to help us understand by creating carrots and sticks, right? Internalize risk where we want them to internalize risk, that sort of thing. And it's the same thing. It's an education. There's, there's a huge education component in what I'm talking about as well. And the education is not the end of it. The policies help to establish ways in which we can begin to internalize risk. And then, of course, there has to be constant reinforcement of that. Because I know right now, local boards, like you were talking about, local wetland boards here that are along our coastline, they're developing new ordinances, local laws, to prevent coastal areas from being developed because there's overdevelopment and because the, the danger, like down in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, the danger is just too high. Of course, these local homeowners are really, really upset at this. And they're really upset because they have no reason to think that they're otherwise that land that they owned, that undeveloped land should not have been developed. And as a matter of fact, the local board, the local assessor's office was taxing that land as a developable piece of property at a higher rate, right? So they were paying higher taxes. They have every good reason to be upset. And one of the reasons why is, is because our, our policies are disjointed. We don't have a, right? We don't have an umbrella set of policies and we're not reinforcing those policies with norms and behaviors and patterns of consistency, right? Even when we do have a policy, it's like, oh, well, sorry, it was developable last year. You should have developed last year. It's not developable this year. And you know, down in Cape Cod, uh, we're talking about you know land that could be three, four, five, seven hundred thousand dollars undeveloped. You know, the piece of property in its undeveloped state can be worth that, right along the coastline. So we're talking about significant sums at stake as well. So there's a real you know education all the way around, but it's also activities of reinforcement. If we haven't seen that, by the way, um, in what's happening right now nationally, just in terms of right our. Uh, our body politic and our citizenry. We are divided in so many ways because we can't find a common way of thinking about things. And government's not doing a, su a super good job. So education has to happen on every level is just the point. And I just was thinking about your talk as well. Actually, as other questions are coming in and they're kind of related to this, can we kind of address them? Then we'll, we'll go to Kaleem um, in a little bit because so the, the, there's, a, there's a related question to uh, Taiwo of looking at have you if you're looking at collaborative relationships across nonprofits and other sectors yes i think it's really important you know um, some of the things about um, the role the public should play, you know, Chad really hit the nail on the head, you know, and I think another way to do that, um, especially um, around collaboration is, you know, one nonprofit organization, especially the environmental nonprofits ones should actually come together and um, push forward, you know, bring up that advocacy role, you know, attend, you know, community meetings and bring up these issues. And I think that that's like a way a first step forward in um, having them heard by the public and then you know government officials and I think I think that's one way to be able to push forward in a collaborative manner you know agreeing on some specific solutions and pushing them forward. So um, and, and related to that Chad do you want to answer Jason Baker's question in the chat? Yeah. How has new waterfront construction fared in flood events following construction? Has more resilient construction, raising foundations, for example, actually resulted in less damage and less need for disaster assistance? That's Jason's question in case anybody is not reading it. So yeah, I think in some areas, this, this is certainly true. I think, uh, for example, locally here, the city of Boston, you know, built uh, a lot of uh, Back Bay in Boston, a very popular area. It's called Back Bay because it used to be a bay. It, it was filled, right? So much of Boston is filled. So it is literally at the water's edge. And if you look at the Atlantic Northeast, we're, we're about two and a half centimeters per year of sea level rise, some of the highest sea level rise measured across the entire uh, coastal United States. It's happening quicker here. So Boston's a great example of where you have a lot of development right up to the water's edge because it's all of its fill. So it literally filled the water in the harbors uh, and it's high value property. And they're doing a lot of things where they're like you're talking about resiliency in terms of retrofitting, in terms of you know moving all of the HVAC equipment, you know multiple layers above uh, baseline. So no more basement, no more bottom first floor. You can open up um, you, like you're talking about freeboarding. So if you're outside of the city, now it's about, you know, raising, right, putting on concrete stilts, essentially giving freeboard, uh, you know, the separation between the house itself. 
And uh, it's so creating resiliency in, in development requirements and building requirements. And the answer is generally um, yes for areas that are densely populated. But in other areas, like I think you're talking about the new types of development, like for example, um, I, I've been doing some consulting with Miami Beach, Miami Beach in Florida. They have huge issues that they cannot solve through the things that you're talking about because the infrastructure, Miami Beach gets these king tides, they get these high tides, and because they're sitting on top of effectively a fossilized coral, all of that sort of, you know, the water comes directly in from Biscayne Bay and it moves right up. And if you've ever seen, you can just go on YouTube and see this in a video, it comes right up the floods, um, you know, so the, um, the flooding grate grates and the, uh, the discharge, uh, stormwater discharge grate. So it comes right up into the streets and starts filling up the streets, the main streets and thoroughfares. And it goes right up and, and floods the entire area. So you can't really create resiliency from that. That's the bay literally coming back in and reclaiming portions of the land. There's no good resiliency for that. So it just depends on where you are and what you're thinking about. Now, in terms of disaster assistance, you know, Boston can do all of those things, but if they get a category four, if Superstorm Sandy just moved a bit north, if it wasn't pushed down by a high pressure system, Boston would have been devastated. And there's no way of avoiding that. So the type of resiliency that you're talking about is one kind, but it's, it's, it's sort of like a piecemeal, small scale where what people like Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott at Rice University, if you haven't uh, read Jim Elliott stuff, um, he talks about you know, formulating a proactive hazard-based framework of policy development as opposed to, you know, so in other words, all coastal areas, particularly low-lying like Boston, the entire policy development would be framed around an umbrella of hazard. Like we live in a hazardous area. This is a hazard and we assume all bad things are going to happen and all of our policy development is gonna be based on that large scale assumption. And I think that's what we're talking about is sort of implementing, redefining what it means to live in these low lying coastal areas. So can I ask you then to address the uh, Renisha's question? So in redefining, so how, how do you see information and communication technology and e-resilience now redefining our understanding of, of risk? Oh, I don't, I don't, I honestly, I, so I'm not a, a closer ICT playing, I'm, I'm just reading it, Coastal Climate Resiliency Planning. So one of the things that I, I mean, so climate resiliency planning is happening and it's mostly happening in a reactive stance, right? It's mostly happening because places are being forced into because of the conditions they're experiencing. And that reactive stance is difficult because it comes into direct conflict with the past. It's a different way of thinking. And to the point that I was making before that I think Tai, tai Wu made pretty well, which is we're asking local actors, many of them that are, you know, they're not sophisticated in this area at all. They're not trained for these types of things. And even if they are land managers, they're not trained in, you know, climate resiliency. It's a new area. It's a new thing. And so I don't know what the difference between what I'm suggesting is that there's a fundamental large gap between what we say we want to do and some of these sort of like, you know, siloed policies and then the world of what we've actually done and continue to do. And if it was a, a, a scale, if it was, you know, it's like a, an 800 pound gorilla versus a tiny little chihuahua, you know, in terms of, and, you know, usually if they're going to, and I don't mean to, but if they're going to do battle, the gorilla wins every time, right? Just because of its size and its scale. And I don't know, um, I, I don't think I can give a direct answer to that, but to me, that is the, that's the measure of the problem from, from this sort of vantage point. Kaleem, how is that, all of that relate to uh, public awareness of the Greener City Initiatives, which is fascinating to see your uh, map, by the way, to see uh, both the choice and the type of city that is, I was looking at, at the states that I know, and I'm looking at the at the dots like in the middle of the state. I'm like, why is one in the middle of Massachusetts, but not Boston, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, getting the public involved um, in clean transportation and reduction of GHGs in the transportation sector, right? So, I mean, there's a number of different things. Uh, you know, Chad mentioned education. Education is something here, but I think the coalition program is trying to get the public involved. Um, in, a, in a sort of a unique, a unique way. But as you said, Nick, you know, overlaying that, we, we clearly see from the analysis that the, uh, this sort of diffusion of, of information and the uptake of the clean vehicle technology 
um, regulatory environment matters. And you see that in the map, right? Yeah. Uh, two sides of that. So if states, so if jurisdictions set um, what we call uh, RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standards, right? Now this is voluntary, right? So some states are involved, so they set targets, targets for GHG reduction, state targets, right? Now that helps, incentives. So financial incentives, um, rebates, uh, uh, um, tax sorts of uh, mechanisms and so on also helps. Um, so you see, you quickly see that in the geography where there's more proactivity on the regula regulatory side, uh, you see more coalitions building up there. Now the coalitions have to, to have to have to survive, right? They have to be sustainable, um, um, and that means engaging the public, right? So actually, what we see over time is the 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 coalitions that build their successes and grow over time are actually where you have the the uh, the more proactive regulatory environment as well. Now, I'll just say one more thing, just the last thing is, is that a really kind of kid-like question that people ask, and I ask as well is, so, you know, if, if transitioning of vehicles, of, of transportation to clean, uh, clean technologies, electric vehicles, hybrids, and so on, right? The, the government is working with the private sector and non-profit sector to do this. Um, well, why don't, why don't we see more government agencies with wholly green fleets, right? And usually government agencies don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. Right? Green, green why procurement. Aren't, um, why aren't you doing it if, it, if it's so great, right? Um, and it, it's a little bit unfair in, in a sense, right? But it is very focusing for the public, right? Why aren't we seeing the municipal um, 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 government fleet uh, doing that? Why don't we see the mayor in a hybrid vehicle, right? Why don't we see those things? Um, and that is something that we have to get over. It, 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 um, you know, encouraging the transition by actually showing that um, we are doing this too, true in local government. Um, so yeah. I'll just so, and I'm, I'm going to actually go back to uh, Renisha Blake's question on, on e-resilience. So now um, I've been studying this like crazy when it comes to the sustainability movement and, and apparel and fast moving consumer goods. But um, a lot of focus is being paid now in e-resilience and then the way that we communicate the information and user generated content is the term that's emerging, which means the public has a lot of say in a, in a direction of which information is going. Because if you go on government nonprofit official websites of entities, uh, they're self-lauding and they provide information that sometimes is too technical, but the user generated blogs, communities, and which is the backbone of nonprofit organization support is where the actual technicality and the nitty gritty of, as, as Kaleem was saying, these very basic questions are being asked. Like, um, uh, and so e-resilience is a concept that's emerging, but in the fashion industry is actually it's backfiring because it's led to a lot of greenwashing since everybody wants to spread the good news of sustainability and circularity to the fact that the Union of, of Concern Research and Fashion made a statement last year and said, please stop using the term sustainable fashion. There is no such thing. But now it's, it's emblazoned into the mind of the psyche of the consumer already that some research is showing um, that they think that H&M, for example, is 100% sustainable. So um, e-resilience is something that is going to be very tricky when it comes to sensitive information dissemination. And there's another question for Chad. Um are there specific rules and regulations about climate control if you plan to start a property management company? I think if I understand it correctly, um, it, it, certainly there are gonna be local rules. Um, and if you're in coastal areas, which I'm talking about, and I don't know if that's what you're referring to, if you're in coastal areas, 
there are very likely to be emerging, if they're not already existing, rules, uh, additional rules that you have to go through. Virginia and Massachusetts use, it's un, it, it sounds like Virginia is exactly, Massachusetts uses the Wetlands Protection Act. I've done work in California and Florida as well, and they all use a similar process by which you have to go through special permitting, um, and, and that's for development purposes. But if you're talking about property management, there's no doubt that um, a lot of what's going to happen in the future and what is already happening is that if you, um, I'm just thinking about this because I'm trying to interpret or intuit what you're what you mean specifically, but um, you can give some more detail if you want uh, in, in a subsequent note here. Um, but if you're thinking about managing property in these areas and there is something that happens, there's nothing. I mean, I would assume that the property is either grandfathered in or currently, uh, you know, uh, conforms to all rules and regulations. But if there is an event that occurs that does damage in many areas, what they're doing is um, to the question that was asked earlier is, in, in, in fixing, so in federal, you know, if you're given money uh, or if your insurance covers it for whatever reason, when you fix your property, if it's within these sensitive coastal areas, um, then it's very likely that you'll have to fix it in a certain way. You know, you'll have to give it free board, for example, you'll have to conform to, uh, and obviously knowing and understanding these things, guarantee that as you get towards coastlines, particularly sensitive coastal areas, but even if they're not, even if they're high off the ground for other reasons, there's going to be additional burdens, additional regulatory burdens that anybody has to deal with uh, in terms of managing land, developing land, all of the things that you would think about in terms of uh, uh, doing it. Now, on the other side, there's certainly uh, voluntary proactive things that anybody can do, um, you know, going green because there's, there's market for it. H&M and other uh, companies market themselves as green companies for a reason. Um, because you you know you're garnering a certain clientele, and you could even charge probably a, a premium, right? If you uh, if you had a a green uh, you know government's done a great job. I don't mean to I'm trying to, but it's just my mind can't help. But Colleen's uh, work there. Government's done a really good job of trying to incentivize and move an industry, the automotive industry, away from fossil fuels, and that's how you do it. You begin it. You you seed it. You can't do it all. Government can't afford to pay for it all, but it helps to create incentives to allow companies like Tesla. You know, Tesla has lived for a, a long time before it went uh, public and even now, even as a, a, a public company, through the, um, the emissions trading credits that it has under the Clean Air Act, because it doesn't, right, none of its cars, it's an automobile manufacturer, and none of its cars generate any emissions, so it has a lot of credits it can sell to other companies in California. Um, that need additional credits, whether they're, you know, they use natural gas to, you know, if it's a power plant or other things. The point is governments allowed companies like Tesla and companies like GM and Ford and every other that are now developing significant electric uh, capacities has really incentivized them through tax credits, through other things to allow them to start moving in this direction. Of course, there's a, a tipping point. So the point is, uh, we're doing the same things can happen at the coastline. They can happen in, you know, where you can help to incentivize and move human beings, right? As is really, if you think about it from a basic, it's supply and demand, right? I mean, if there's a demand for these things, I told you humans love to live along the coastlines. There's a myriad of reasons why. There's just, that's because where I come from, this is where we already live. And I really love living near the coastline because I love the water and that sort of thing. But we can take advantage of these things. We just have to do it in the, in the reality. That, we, that, that is coming to us. And we have to also envision a reality, a future that's probably gonna be at least as risky and more risky along coastal lines. And as we need to wrap it up though, I also wanna uh, make one last point um, back to how this relates to uh, Kaleem's findings on the why, why is government not acting as a trendsetter and an example. Uh, we've, we've studied these with my friends who are studying green procurement. A lot of government offices still don't have a green procurement programs. They don't have green procurement policies. Even if there's sustainable options, they will not get their own paper products that are come from recycled paper, right? I work with in the fashion industry and tracking how um, INGOs and disaster relief, since we're talking about disaster relief, don't have an incentive to purchase blankets for first responders from recycled material. They will get the cheap ones that are made out of polyester when you actually have greener options out there, but without green policies, and we always say in, in political economy, the biggest um, consumer in the world is the US government. Without the US government consuming and setting up green consumption uh, examples, 
um, um, we can get into e-resilience and, and communicate with each other, but the government is going to set it down. Um, with that, we're at 1146, so we need to stop at 1145. It was a great discussion. I want to thank everybody for participating. I'm so glad to, to meet the panelists and to see that we had really nice um, attendance today of 20 some people attended. Great questions and um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.